So now that I've redrawn the shape, so now that I've redrawn, <laughs> thanks man. Now that I've redrawn the shape, um, I am just, again, cutting to those lines. Same as I was doing before, but this is a more refined cut at this point, because if I can achieve a nice clean cut, that will that can stay and be a finished spoon, uh, finished surface on the spoon. So the goal is to have my cuts be nice and smooth and even, which hopefully they will be because yeah, I'm cutting a, a smaller surface at this point. Um, so, um, and one small detail that's important at this stage is that I always do this, the handle before I do the shoulder because sometimes when you're coming down the handle it pops free and, and your knife ticks into the shoulder and, um, and you end up damaging a surface and if you haven't cut it yet then it's not a big deal you'll just clean it up when you get around to cutting it but if you just spend a bunch of time getting a nice clean cut and then your knife slams into it well that feels like a real pain in the neck so one of the things I like about these cook spatulas is that this curve here on the neck transition is just really easy to make once you're able to get this sort of transition clean this sort of transition is very fast and so it makes carving this spoon very simple despite it being uh, sort of delivering a very complex spoon at the end the process of carving it is quite straightforward which I like okay once I've done the outline <clears throat> again I'm gonna do the same top and bottom <clears throat> And again, these cuts are the same as the cuts I was using earlier. It's just that I'm moving a little bit smoother. There's less to be removed. All the alignment issues should hopefully have been dealt with already. And you can see I'm not even going to bother recarving this top face. That top face is totally fine, as is the back face. So all I'm going to worry about is getting the rim and the curvature on the back exactly how I want it. Remember, if there's no point, and if you can get that back face or the top face of the handle to be exactly how you want it, and your knife finish is good, don't recarve it just for the sake of recarving it. Leave it how it is, because that saves you time, and it reduces the risk that you then mess up this thing that was already good. So now I'm gonna now that I have the rim the way I want it, and get the center exactly how I want it. I'm gonna blend between the two, yeah. Those wide cuts are hard. I can already tell that the thing that's gonna be hard is that I really push this thumb to the limit doing all of the, that roughing out. And so I can tell that by the end of this, that's gonna be the thing that hurts. We'll see. So I'm trying to do these cuts as long as possible, starting way choked up in my hand and then extending and then even doing a pivot. And then, because I don't want to have to recut this because it's already a nice smooth face, I'm going to be very careful in how I blend this in. I'm not going to, I'm going to be, try really hard not to cut that in. So then, voila, there's that one done. So now transfer them back to the original bag. Notice how I'm keeping them bagged up at all times. So they come from one bag, they get worked on, they go to another bag. And at no time am I letting these blanks sit out. That's super important. Oh, I'm not wearing my apron right now either. Oh well, let's get wood chips in my pockets. So, carving the outline, which I didn't make this rim perhaps as thin as I ought to have. Let's thin it up a little bit before I go any further so I can get a nice clean nice clean outline if you can cut the size of your rim in half well that will take half the effort to cut it so it's worth pushing your rim to be really close 
not super duper close, but in general, as I go through each step, I about I reduce the thickness of the rim to about half of what the previous step had it. And that's really helpful in being able to get nice, smooth, extended cuts. Okay. A little bit more. These round forms are always a little trickier to get just right because there's no hiding whether the geometry is correct. Hello from Brazil back. Very nice. Okay. It's curious. I suspect not very many people are going to watch all of this in a row simply because it's a lot to watch, but I really think that as a resource it's going to be great. Oh, let me see who's calling. I have no idea who that is. Just let it go. Let's see, I can't see what I'm carving, so I stop and I look at it and I try and transfer that to what I'm seeing in the back here. There we go. Good, and again, I leave everything attached here. And then carve this back shoulder like that. The goal with this step is to essentially get everything finished up on the top and bottom and sides and, and get it ready for chamfering the handle because the two steps after this are going to be um, chamfering the handle, actually there's three steps, chamfering the handle, carving the bowls, and then carving the back of the bowls on some of the spoons, not all of them. Some of them are going to be uh, simply by like that cook spatula is the back of the bowl is exactly how it's going to be. Whereas this scoop back of the bowl is going to need to be lightened up once I get the, the inside of the bowl exactly how it wants to be. And the same is true for the eaters. Okay. Let's see, I'm taking the time to get this shoulder connection really tight here. Good. Mess with that just a little bit. And then trim the end. Again, I'm shooting for about five minutes per spoon for this stage. And because I didn't do a real clean line down the top of the handle, I'm going to recarve it. Otherwise, I would have left it. Okay. Good. All those glory shades on the floor. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the mess on the floor <clears throat> is that when I carve in the kitchen during the time of year when I'm inside carving, the floor is actually, there's maybe a few shavings here and there, but there's no dog hair, there's no dust, there's no random scraps of paper from the girls. Like I, it gets swept up every day. And when I am not carving in the kitchen, guess what? No one's sweeping the kitchen. And so the house, the floor is much more of a mess when I'm not working in the kitchen. My wife actually prefers it when I do because then it keeps the room clean. So if you want your wife to let you carve in the kitchen, make sure you are leaving it better than how it would be Otherwise, <clears throat> all right, good. So now I've got the top face the way I want it. Looks good, needs to be pushed down a little more. And this is where you want to be looking at it from the sides, from the front, from the back, making sure you actually have the curvature that you want. Like that. Very nice. Very nice. Now, because I'm going to be carving the back of this bowl quite a bit, um, yeah, pro tip, exactly. 
Because I'm going to be carving the back of this bowl quite a bit, the only thing I'm going to work on is just, again, having the width of that rim. And then once I've carved the inside of the bowl, I'm going to come back and do the outside. So not only am I having it, I'm also trying to make it fairly even. So at each stage of making it half of what it was, I also try and reduce the amount of variability in the rim so that this stage is pretty even and it'll get even more even as I go along. But you want that kind of sort of pulling things into precision slowly rather than trying to get it right at the beginning because it's just not worth it at the beginning. Try and do that. There we do. Nice simple cut down the back. Get that cleaned up. And this kind of cut can be really helpful on long straight handles for getting a nice clean line. So there we have it. Number two in the bag. What's next out of the bag? Ooh, this one. This one was a bit of a pain. Has some real squirrely green. Same deal though. I'm gonna feel out that grain, make sure I'm carving it in the right direction. And notice how choked up I am on both the knife, right? I'm using the very tip and I'm holding it super tight. If I was holding it back here, I'd have way less power. So making sure you're really choked up on where you're trying to go gives you the most power. Obviously it's possible to be too far choked up, but there's a, there's a sweet spot where you've got the most power and the most control. And that's true for axing on how choked up to be on your handle axing. That's true for carving, any given situation in carving. There's always a sweet spot. And your job is to figure out where that is and utilize it to the best of your ability. Okay. This handle really needed to be sort of realigned. So one side starts off small and goes deep, Whew. and the other side is going to start off deep and go small. Why am I batch carving today? Because I have a goal, Matt, of doing 10 spoons today. I've never carved 10 spoons in a day, but my goal is to carve 10 spoons today for the gathering so that tomorrow I can maybe make some blanks to sell to people. I thought that might be a nice thing. Uh, and I also thought this would be a fun variable to see if batch carving is more efficient and how much more efficient and how hard it is and whether I enjoy it and also to create a different sort of series of videos for the virtual apprenticeship challenge where by showing it in batches you can see the same part of the process over and over and over again and it allows you to focus in on the thing that maybe you're struggling with. Uh, I've heard that about my axing videos, you know, where I'm making blanks for other people and so I'm axing and axing and axing and how valuable that is to be able to see the whole process over and over again and certain things surface with certain spoons that don't always surface so it's useful to capture them in that way. So we'll see. So far I found it hard on my body because when you start off doing a batch car, the first thing you do is rough out everything and that's definitely the hardest part on your body. Okay, now that I've got that basically good. You've been doing it that way all week, three a day, holy cow. Let's see a variety of styles that want to also find similarities between the styles. Yes, exactly. And what you'll see is that my process is remarkably similar from one to the next. There are subtle and Im but important differences in how I might address certain things, but uh, to a large extent, I think larger than most people realize, the process is the same from one to the next. Okay, now this one had squirrely grain on the top of the handle, so I want to do a very simple handle that will hopefully sidestep all that. Good, success, and now we do a little bump down here, and then right here is where the squirreliest grain is, right there on the shoulder, so let's see if we can resolve that at this moment. Okay. 
in the moment of truth. Can he do it, folks? What are you saying, Matt? I A. All right, good. Okay, that got resolved. Very nice. Looks good from this angle. Got a slight bump here. I want to remove. Good. So now again with eaters, the goal is going to be. Well, this has got way too much material, but. The goal is not to try and get the back perfect at this stage. The goal is to get the rim slightly drawn down and get the, the curvature of the rim exactly how I want it. But not try and get the back of the spoon exactly right because I won't know what that is until I hollow the bowl and get the bowl, the inside of the bowl exactly right. So. It's a waiting game at this stage. You found you have to go with the flow a bit more when you separate the axing. It's axing further dry. Just changing the next rough out. Yeah, yep. It's true. You have to moisture management, I think, is a crucial part. I mean, I think it's a crucial part of any carving, but I think it's especially crucial when you're batch carving and doesn't get talked about enough. Because it's, it's real easy for things to dry out and then you are struggling. So you can see I'm trying to be swift and get it back into the bag as soon as possible. And when I was axing out the batch, I was bagging them up as I went as well. So, there's that one. Action airplane. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like dry too, but it's, it's real easy to end up struggling just because you let it get too dry, is what I found. All right, guys, I'm not going to be able to do all of these right now because I have a uh, business phone call i got to make in about 15 minutes. So... Be prepared, you're gonna see about half of these getting done. Maybe I'll do a uh, pocket spoon and a scoop next so you can see any variations in that process. Good, see this one was quite lopsided so there's quite a lot to take off. And you can see how I'm doing this cut blind and then just keep looking at it, make sure I I'm doing what I think I'm doing. I find I get a sweeter curve that way with the hand squeeze cut than with any other type of cut. So it's always worth doing it blind and then continuing to look at it for feed. Excuse me for feedback. All right. And you can see how this stage of redrawing halfway through really allows me to get super clean, even, aligned, symmetrical spoons out of a blank that was not those things. And how that allows me to be much looser and faster with the early parts of the process, which is important, especially for me, because I'm not a perfectionist. So I can hold it together for a short period of time, but I'm just not interested in making every stage of the process perfect. In fact, I'm heavily invested in the opposite and being able to have them be not perfect and have it not matter. So that's how I figured out how to do these parts. <clears throat> so I really get it looking right from the top down and then later shape up from the side profile. Exactly. Yeah, that's so important because um, you, you can use a pencil looking at it from the top down, but as soon as you do anything to the, to the top, you obliterate that pencil line. So it just makes sense to do it in that order, right? It's just, I don't know, it just seems like common sense to me. I haven't figured out a better way to do it. If you can think of one, let me know. I'm always open to new ideas.
And notice how I'm predominantly using the hand squeeze and the, the pull stroke. And I'm not using any of those other strokes because I found that they're just slower. They're slower, they're less precise, and I end up with a less good looking spoon at the end, right? Like this cut might be cool to do a different cut, but it sure is a heck of a lot slower and less precise. So I stick with a few basics and just learn how to execute them extremely well. Okay. Now, top face of the handle. Yeah, good. And you'll notice that a lot of the cuts that I'm avoiding are either cuts that have relatively little power or cuts like the chest lever cut that have very little control of where the cut ends up going. Um, I really have a lot of beef with that chest lever cut because while it can generate a lot of power, you lack, you completely lack control over how it exits. And that to me is not acceptable especially at this part of the process where I want total control over what the knife is doing because there's just not that much material left. So I think it's worth analyzing what cuts you're employing also. So the one place where I do do a cut that has relatively little control is right here on the back of the handle because I value having a nice ah, clean smooth line over having total control because it can just pop off the end there and be fine. But I get a much cleaner line this way than if I did it any other way. pocket spoon remember this line that I drew here was actually the inside rim so as I carve around I need to start leaving the material that I want to see on the rim itself so you can see I'm actually leaving material there and I'm watching out for bits where the grain changes a little squirrely bit there on the side that I had to make sure I carve in the right direction These pocket spoons can be fast to carve the outline to because there's no shoulder, there's no neck. But where they are slower is that it's harder to carve the it's harder to carve the um, it's harder to carve the top face because it's so wide. It just requires a lot of force. So. Okay, good, 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 all right, and then always trim the end. Will it go light down, sweetie? It's okay. Okay, and now as I carve this top face, it's going to obliterate this most of this rim that I've drawn, but that's okay because now that I have the size right, I can just 
feel that out with the hook knife at the next stage. So even if I want the top face here to be flat, which I'm not sure I do or not, it's helpful to do this part as a shallow plane simply because it's just a real pain in the neck to try and go across the whole thing. Half, trying to go across half of it is hard enough. And so to get flat, what you do is you, you do essentially what I'm doing now and then you kind of knock off the middle bump. And even if it's not truly perfectly flat, your brain tricks you into thinking it is. Uh, what am I doing? Here we go. And depending on the way the grain is, you can end up with some really beautiful patterns by letting there be a gentle spine in the middle. Who? that's hard. Good. And then again, I just want to... Good. And I'm just going to even that sucker up. Good. So you can see I've got the right amount there. Now I'm going to pull the rim up slightly. But again, the bowl is going to be reduced mainly once I carve the inside bowl because the outside responds to what the inside needs to be to feel right in your mouth. So I'm going to get it roughly right, but I'm assuming that I'm going to go back to it. What I can do that's more finished now is do the back side. Since I got this kind of the way I want to have it, I can then pull a weird little grain change there. Hi from Argentina. Argentina? All right. I only know one other spoon carver who's ever followed me from Argentina. Well done. All right, so now I'm going to pull this center facet down. Rah! These spoons, even though they look really simple, are hard to carve for this reason, that there's these wide facets. And it's just, it takes a lot of force and a really sharp knife to get them just right. Okay, good. Let's see. Just feel out this one little spot, see why it looks kind of torn out. Okay. Good. Okay, there's that. Now, my phone call is gonna come in any minute now. So I'm gonna start on a scoop, but I might need to bail on this live pretty soon, but this is good. I've been going for, I don't know how long, and I've done five of the 10, this will be number six. The scoops are always tricky and it has to do with all the end grain you're trying to cut across to do the, the outside of the bowl. It's just a lot harder on the knives than a shallower spoon, which is why they take so long. This is one spot where I might do this potato peeler cut, which even though it has less power, 
will allow me to hog in close to this line more accurately. But then once I get close to it, I will then switch to the this cut to go um, right up to it because because <clears throat> I can't get a nice clean line with that cut. It's pretty choppy. So there we go. Good. Okay, now I need to do these little divots. And that's where I use just the tip of the knife. And you can only do this with like a Mora 106 or an equivalent. And that is my phone call. Talk to you guys later.